Okay. Good morning and welcome. Can I ask everybody to take their seats, please? It is now my extremely great pleasure to invite Megan Mitchell to the stage. Megan is our National Children's Commissioner and Human Rights Commissioner. Please welcome Megan to the stage. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank um, uh, Sharon um, and also to Frank, the um, CEO of Snake, for inviting me to do the opening address or opening welcome here today. Um, I'm honoured um, to be sharing um, this session with Marta Marez Perez and Cindy Blackstock, and who I think you all know have a strong uh, international reputation uh, working to protect children's rights. Um, so I think we're very honoured to have them here, be here today. I'd like to thank uh, Henrietta for that um, wonderful welcome to country. I feel I've been thoroughly welcomed um, to um, this place, this land, and and uh, that, but that there is so much more I could learn about the stories and the land here. So thank you for that. And also thank you to those who provided the tribute to um, a great Australian that I know whose work um, and life and times meant so much to so many of us. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians um, of the land who we um, gather on today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, the name of this conference is For Our Children Living and Learning Together. And this has particular relevance um, for me and resonance for me. Because it's vitally important for me in my new role as National Com Children's Commissioner to listen and learn about the lives, the hopes and dreams of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. And as Commissioner, I have a key role in acting as a National Children's uh, advocate for all our children, no matter where they come from. The Australian Human Rights Commission legislation which governs my work requires me to give particular attention to children who are at risk or vulnerable. And in this context, I know that the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, in its concluding observation on Australia last year, identified Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children as one of the, these groups requiring particular attention. And this is for good reason. And while there have been improvements um, in some areas for Aboriginal kids, and we'll be hearing a lot about those here today, and I think it's really important to have those positive news stories, the disparities between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and their non-Indigenous peers remains a significant concern. While it's pleasing to see under five mortality rates, for instance, starting to fall, the latest figures um, still show that infant mortality rates were 1.7 times as high for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander infants compared with non-Indigenous infants. And babies born to Aboriginal mothers are twice as likely to have a low birth weight. Young uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, between 15 and 19 are much more likely to die by suicide than other young Australians. And while youth suicide rates nationally have been slowly decreasing over time, there's been a dramatic increase in the rates of youth suicide in places like the Northern Territory. And between 2006 and 2010, the rate of suicide for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people increased by 160%. And the levels of self-harm and attempted suicide are even greater. Uh, only last Friday, Helen Christensen, uh, who's the executive director of the Black Dog Institute, warned that action, urgent action must be taken to curb the ri rising rate of suicide in WA's Indigenous communities. Um, and the Australian Bureau of Statistics National Survey of Mental Health and Wellbeing in 2000 um, seven provides some staggering statistics that, that 20, 22,000 men and nearly 43,000 women attempted suicide in that year. I think these are something we really need to look at. In relation to girls, Professor Christensen particularly commented that there is a real role in the future to look at how we get girls, get to girls who are making these attempts. They are really unhappy, not coping, and finding life very difficult. So I think one of our key roles here is to think about how we can build that resilience and hope in our children. 
I think in this context it was particularly timely that the Australian government announced um, a new national strategy um, aimed at uh, Aboriginal uh, at reducing suicide and suicide prevention measure, measures in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and committed 17.8 million um, to this over four years and that was just announced quite recently. In education, there have been some real improvements both in attendance and literacy and numeracy indicators and I'm sure we'll hear about those in this, um, in this conference, but it remains the fact that those rates are still much lower um, uh, among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students than among their non-Indigenous peers by three to ten percentage points. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people are also disproportionately represented uh, among groups of children who need special protection. And we're very familiar with these figures. Of the record 40,000 children in out-of-home care in Australia in 2012, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children were 10 times more likely to be in care. And they were eight times more likely to be the subject of substantiated abuse and neglect. And finally, the figures on children and young people in contact with the criminal justice system are particularly sobering. According to the Australian Health, uh, Institute of Health and Welfare, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children were 31 times as likely as non-Indigenous young people to be in tension on an average night in 2012. And this is up from 27 times as likely in 2008. And as I said, these figures are not new and they point to the many challenges we face in ensuring that children and young people, Aboriginal children and young people, uh, do enjoy their basic human rights. These are rights to health, to safety, to education and protection. There's no doubt that improving the wellbeing and rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children should continue to be a national priority. It is positive in this regard that the government recently um, reaffirmed its ongoing commitment to the overarching strategy of close the gap, closing the gap, and we really need to maintain that rage. And this is also reflected in the second action plan of the National Framework for Protecting Australia's Children with an overarching goal of bringing down the over-representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in child protection systems. In this context, there are many opportunities to positively support communities to address the needs of children and young people and to look for holistic and preventative ways to do so so that kids and families are diverted from costly, large, uh, costly and largely ineffective systems which often serve to entrench disadvantage rather than address it. I've been pleased, very pleased to be able in my new role to join forces with Mick Gooder, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner, in promoting a justice reinvestment strategy. The idea is that a portion of public funds that would normally have been spent on covering the costs of law, order, imprisonment and statutory care in communities is instead invested in community programs, services and activities aimed at addressing the underlying causes and determinants of crime, dislocation and disengagement in those communities. This, I believe, represents a much better investment in our children by diverting them from the criminal justice and care systems in the first place. Justice reinvestment strategies um, are widely now being adopted in a lot of places around the world, in particular in the USA. And last year, Mick pointed to the, um, the success in Texas in particular, which over a four-year period has saved $1.8 billion uh, in the criminal system and the rates of crime um, and incarceration have been halted for the first time in decades. So I think we've got real evidence that this works. So I recently returned from a visit to Burke with Mick, where we were invited by the local community to discuss the possibilities of a justice reinvestment approach. And we talked with the community at a community forum, and we also talked with a number of children and young people. And I have to say that despite these young people's struggles to say, stay in school, to stay out of trouble, um, they were also incredibly motivated to get a job and do well in life. They had hope in their hearts despite their circumstances. 
They also told me they wanted to be respected and treated equally and not be discriminated against. They identified boredom as an issue and made very practical suggestions um, uh, to engage them positively in their community. A skate park, oh well, they always say that, but <laughs> um, a drop-in centre which employed young people, transport to get them to and from activities and take them home at night, cultural and sports programs like netball and footy, they're all footy mad up there, um, more employment opportunities. They said they, they wouldn't mind a Macca's or a KFC so they can actually get a job there as well as get access to cheap food. Um, they also talked about um, broadening the range of TAFE courses and vocational courses they can do at school. And some of the girls in particular talked about the need for Aboriginal child-friendly um, playgroups and childcare. These are very simple things. They don't actually cost a lot of money and yet they weren't available to these young people who, who virtually just sort of walked around the street every afternoon after school, getting in trouble with the police mostly. One of the elders at the forum specifically acknowledged the presence of the young people there and noted how pleased she was that they were engaged in the process and called for um, young people to be an intrinsic part of any reinve justice reinvestment um, approach that the community um, embarks on. One of the other concerns raised by the UN Committee in its concluding observations about Australia um, was it pointed to the fact that we don't necessarily do child participation um, very well. Um, Article 12 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child it states that a child has a right to have their views respected and to have a say in decisions that affect them. The UN Committee noted that Australia does not generally have adequate ways of taking into account the views of children, especially those under 15, and especially Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. Despite this, there are some great examples of children and young people having a say and having an influence on decisions. For example, we know that CREATE, who's here today with some young people, does some wonderful work um, with children in the care system, um, showcasing and respecting their views and ensuring that they have a voice in how the care system is operating. And it's inspiring to see that there are, that the, um, representation of young people here taking part in this conference and I was lucky enough to meet some of you last night and I hope I meet more of you over the conference. But of course we can do much better. Um, I believe listening to children and taking their views into account should be in systematically integrated into the work of government and non-government organisations. And not just because the UN committee tells us to do it, it's because Children are the experts in their own lives, and I think we need to talk to the experts about what will work for them. If we listen to them, we understand more clearly what needs to be done and what will actually work for them. So one of my priorities as National Commissioner, one of my first priorities, is to listen and learn from children and young people themselves and to ask them to help me identify priorities for my work. So some of the things I want children and young people to tell me are what would life make life better for children and young people in Australia? What makes you happy and what are you concerned about? What rights are most important to you? And how can I keep engaged with you? I'm calling this process the big banter and it starts today. Um, I'm launching it here because I think we really, one of our most concerning priorities is, the, uh, is improving outcomes for Aboriginal children and young people. I plan to visit city and country areas in each state and territory over the next few months and hold targeted focus groups with children, children's advocates and with governments. And I'm interested in speaking to as diverse a group of kids as possible. Um, and I'm hoping that I can rely on all of you to get to as many children as I can. I can't visit everywhere and speak to all the groups of children or their advocates, but I'm also uh, putting in place a number of other ways that people can engage with me. And I want you to let people know I'm officially listening and bantering. Um, so we've also got at the Commission, at the Human Rights Commission on its website, which is www.humanrights.gov.au, and there's a number of other links to the big banter through that, an online survey um, and storytelling site for the big banter so that I can hear 
the views of children and young people who I don't get the chance to directly engage with. You can get, and I've told you how you can get to it, so please let um, children and young people know that I'd love to hear from them and I'm genuinely seeking their help in making sure that I can work um, for their rights and in their interests as best I can. So I'll conclude there. Welcome again to the fifth annual SNAKE conference uh, to all 1,100 of you. Uh, and thank you all for coming together um, for, a better, to, for the better of tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. And we do look forward to, to catching up with you around the country as you participate in the big banter. And anybody, if you hear Megan is coming to town, being around, please make, a, make an effort, gather children, and make sure their voices are being heard. Thank you, Megan. My next, next task is to introduce our first key, keynote speaker, Ms. Marta Marez Perez. Marta is going to talk to us about the rights to culture for Indigenous children in the Conventions of the Rights of a Child. Um, and as we welcome Marta to the stage, Marta is a member and vice president of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child um, and is an independent consultant in social policy, human rights and international relations. Marta is a Chilean, a socialist, and for, the, for, the most, uh, for most of her life, Marta has worked for the United Nations, which she joined in 1974, and I can't believe that date. And she served in different senior capacities and organizations, both in field stations in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. Please join me in welcoming Marta to the stage. Good morning, everyone. First, allow me to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the lands we meet on, and to thank Sharon, Megan, Henrietta, and the kids for a very thoughtful and very warm welcome to all of us this morning. I want to thank you also for giving me this opportunity to open along with such distinguished and wonderful women, a conference that promises to be a rich experience for all of us. In preparing for it, I had been wondering, what can I tell you that you have not already covered in the previous conferences and in your own lifetime of experiences, relationships, and studies, much more direct and surely much richer than mine? So. I hope to be able to provide you with what I know and I have worked on all my life, which is basically a view of children's rights, and in this case, focusing particularly on indigenous children's rights, from an international perspective, using the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is the center pillar, the central pillar of any discussion and action regarding children. And I will also touch on the, on the framework provided by the UN and, in general, the multilateral system. In particular, I want to focus on cultural rights of indigenous children, as seen from the convention, and the interpretation that the Committee on the Rights of the Child gives to, to that. Um, and I will look very briefly at persistent poverty and at the impact of business on indigenous children's rights, drawing from recent work by the committee itself and other UN entities, and illustrating from experience and jurisprudence mainly from Latin America and from Australia. Um, I was already introduced, um, apart from being a, a socialist, Sharon, I'm a sociologist, <laughs> social scientist, and I have worked all my life, basically, my professional life in the UN, uh, and in particular in UNICEF, uh, I think all over the world, basically. Um, in the committee, my last four years after I retired from the UN, uh, I have been one of the vice presidents, 
And in, in that capacity, I, was, I had the honor to be the rapporteur, actually a core rapporteur, uh, for Australia when Australia came to present its report in 2012 to the committee. So first, let's look at the UN and the international framework. It is important to note that there is no universal treaty on human rights of indigenous people of a binding nature, a, a convention as such. Historically, there has been the assumption that the rights of, the, of indigenous peoples or minorities are protected primarily on the basis of the non-discrimination principle as enshrined in some of the core international instruments, such as the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination of 1965, and the International Covenants on Human Rights of 1966. But in the last two decades, in particular, the UN has developed a number of different fora and mechanisms for raising the importance of the rights of indigenous people. The, the very important report on, called the World Indigenous Peoples Report of 2009, in fact, calls this activity of the last 20 years as a vigorous and dynamic interface between the UN and indigenous peoples that came about, among other things, precisely because there has been an increasing realization internationally that indigenous people face systemic discrimination and exclusion all over the world, thus requiring specific instruments and not just the core conventions of the, of the UN. Some of them have come about, you know them very well, the ILO Convention Number 169, con of 1991, the Human Rights uh, Commission in, 19, in 2001 designated a special rapporteur on the rights of uh, indigenous people who has in fact visited Australia. And in 2003, the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues was established and has held periodic multi-stakeholder meetings. I'm sure some of you have participated in New York. The last uh, one took place, in fact, a, a week ago. A landmark in this process was the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples of 2007. Now, while this declaration is still a non-binding instrument on states, it means it doesn't obligate states, it has marked an important change of mood in the international arena, which has led the General Assembly to decide to hold a 2014 World Conference on Indigenous Peoples next year, uh, as part of the global development agenda setting process beyond 2015. The Convention on the Rights of the Child is of 1989, as you know, and in 1990 it was ratified almost universally. Um, it is the first and most complete international human rights instrument that makes explicit reference in several of its articles to indigenous children as subjects of rights able to exercise them individually and collectively in terms of their culture, religion, and language. Clearly, of course, all rights enshrined in the Convention on the Rights of the Child apply equally to indigenous children as they do to all children. But as I said, it's important to note that the Convention has been ratified by practically all the countries in the world, and it does oblige, therefore, you know, almost the whole uh, world um, in terms of the um, implementation of child rights. From the point of view, therefore, of indigenous children, the Convention of the Rights of the Child has a heightened importance, particularly its centerpiece for indigenous children, Article 30, and I want to quote it. In those states in which ethnic, religious, or linguistic minorities or persons of indigenous origin exist, a child belonging to such a minority or who is indigenous shall not be denied the right in community with other members of his or her group to enjoy his or her own culture, to profess and practice his or her own religion, or to use his or her own language. And I finish the quote there. Articles 17 and 29 of the CRC also make direct reference to indigenous populations 
on, respectively, the role of mass media regarding the linguistic needs of children belonging to a particular minority or ethnic group, and on the need for education to prepare the child to lead a responsible life in a free and open society among all groups, including persons of indigenous origin. It is explicit. All three art articles were drafted at the time of the drafting of the convention, which took almost 10 years. Uh, they were drafted in recognition that indigenous and minority children are subjected to serious discrimination and vulnerabilities, and therefore require special measures. Though Article 30 that I read is expressed as a prohibition of the denial of rights, shall not be denied the right, the Convention calls for positive ways to respect, protect, and fulfill the rights of all indigenous children and obligates states' party to protect them against acts performed by the state or by other parties. These positive or special measures need to be inspired by the four basic principles of the Convention. In particular, Article 2 reinforces very strongly the notion that states shall respect and ensure the right to non-discrimination based on any condition, whether of the child or of his parents or her parents, including race, national or ethnic origin, language, religion, gender, and others. And on Article 12, on the right of the child to be heard and express his or her opinion, another basic pillar of the Convention, the committee highlights the many obstacles for indigenous children to exercise this right, and was rightly pointed by Commissioner, uh, uh, by Megan. Um, the many obstacles of indigenous children to exercise the right to be heard, and calls on state parties to create an environment that promotes the freedom of expression of children as individuals or as a group, so that they participate in consultation on issues that affect them. It further states that as regards legislation, policies, and programs that affect indigenous children in general, the indigenous community should be consulted and given an opportunity to participate in the process on how the best interests of indigenous children in general can be decided in a culturally sensitive way. But while calling for special measures, the articles in the convention that explicitly refer to indigenous children do not grant indigenous children a special status. And this is important to note. What is meant is that states need to ensure that indigenous children, as well as any minorities, have access to culturally appropriate services in, for example, health, nutrition, education, recreation and sports, social services, housing and sanitation, and juvenile justice. In doing so, states will also need to take care that these services address the multiple layers of discrimination uh, that affect indigenous children, such as indigenous girls or rural uh, children or children with disabilities. Additionally, Article 30 underlines that the enjoyment of culture, religion, and language can be exercised collectively and individually, as you heard me from the reading of the article. It said, the child in community with other members of his or her group. This is an important recognition of the traditions and collective values of indigenous cultures, while at the same time emphasizing the individual nature of the rights of the child. So for both political and civil rights, as for economic, social, and cultural rights of indigenous children, the convention recognizes cultural specificity. And I'll come back to this. Let me just finish this sort of overall framework by saying that the committee, faced with the reality of you know, looking uh, report after report of states trying to implement the Convention on the uh, Rights of the Child became keenly aware that despite explicit guidance, indigenous children continued to experience serious discrimination and sustained discrimination in many different aspects of their lives. Examples 
from the examination of periodic reports by states ranged from, for example, profiling by local police on the basis of race or origin to ethnically blind social policies and indifference to cultural diversity in terms, for example, of identity or name. The committee therefore decided to develop in 2009 a general comment on indigenous children and their rights, number, general comment number 11, in order to provide governments with further guidance on ensuring the rights of indigenous boys, girls, and adolescents, paying particular attention to the right to a cultural life. This has become an important reference in international human rights law regarding indigenous people, and I will use it throughout this talk. Let me turn now to cultural rights. It is clear from the committee experience that many states do not pay specific attention to indigenous children or to their development in the context of their right to lead a cultural life. The starting, the starting point for the committee is self-identification. The fundamental a fundamental criteria for establishing indigenous people's rights. Uh, states need to recognize and respect the distinct cultures, history, language, and way of life as I identified by the indigenous peoples and children themselves, and also as an enrichment of the state's cultural identity. The committee aligns itself with the notion of other committees, of other treaties or conventions, <clears throat> that cultural rights are essential to maintain human dignity and for positive human interaction among individuals and communities in a world increasingly diverse and culturally plural. The committee in its recommendations to states insists that public policies need to take account at least of the following, and let me just quickly run through three aspects four aspects that the committee time and time again <coughs> recommends. Learning an indigenous language alongside the national language as a pillar of the educational system. Health services sensitive to indigenous practices and knowledge. A system of juvenile justice that takes account of traditional systems of justice and the child's own cultural identity. And family services that give priority to the family and community when deciding on issues such as adoption, care, or abuse and violence. In other words, a more integrated approach that will reconcile a children's rights approach with cultural specificity, so that indigenous children can effectively enjoy their rights specifically, but on an equal basis with all children. Some examples from the committee's jurisprudence of 2012 illustrate these points. For Vietnam, for example, the committee urged the state to ensure full respect for, for the preservation of identity for all children and eliminate all efforts to assimilate ethnic minority populations with the king majority, including passing legislative and administrative measures to account for the rights to a name, culture, and language, of indigenous and minority populations. For Canada to take urgent measures to address the overrepresentation of Aboriginal and Afro Canadian children in the criminal justice system and out of home care. And for Australia to review its bringing them home report in order to ensure full respect for the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children to their identity, name, culture, language, and family relationships. In researching for this keynote speech, I came across, thanks to SNAKE, uh, the SNAKE national campaign to address the overrepresentation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people in the child protection system, which I believe will be discussed and hopefully adopted and signed on this week. Um, and I, I think it's, an, it's really an important step in, in the direction that the committee is pushing. It advocates this campaign for a new approach which preserves and strengthens children's identity and connection to their culture and empowers families and communities. It includes as key solutions, and let me just, again, list three of them, which I think are key to the action 
promote understanding and respect for the rights and culture of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. <clears throat> Place family and community decision making at the center of ensuring the safety and well-being of children and increase government expenditure and capacity on prevention and early intervention uh, services. Hopefully, and this is my message to SNAKE, similar action can be organized to combat the steep overrepresentation in the juvenile justice system in Australia, with indigenous children 26 times more likely than non-indigenous children to be in detention. Another aspect of cultural rights highlighted by general comment number 11 is that they need to be exercised within a human rights framework, consistent with respect for others' human dignity and physical integrity. Cultural practices referred to in Article 30 must conform to the Convention as a whole and cannot be justified if they are harmful to the child's dignity, health, or development. Practices such as early marriages, corporal or other degrading punishment, which by the way in Australia is still permissible, and genital mutilation of girls need to be eliminated in active collaboration between the state and the indigenous communities, including children and women themselves, through education, awareness, racing, and legislation to change the norms and stereotypes behind them. In this sense, the committee espouses the concept of respectful, horizontal, and synergic relationships between and among cultures, where integration and coexistence are basic objectives based on dialogue and mutual agreement making diversity a valuable resource. Let me touch quickly on the best interests of the child from the point of view of, uh, of culture. This is the third basic principle of the convention, and you, I'm sure you are familiar with the best interests of the child and how difficult it is to apply it. General Comment 11 elaborates on the need for states and communities to ensure that both the individual as well as the collective perspective is applied when considering the best interests of indigenous children. Here again, the right of children to express their views while the determination of the best interest is being done is um, an important element no, of those uh, decisions. The committee uh, has tried to be practical and operational and in, in its latest general comment on best interest, just issued now in, in March of this uh, year, it has tried to um, both elaborate on the legal and normative aspects, trying to explain the best interest concept from the legal aspect, but also trying to provide guidance, practical guidance, to those who need to apply the best interests uh, uh, concept. Four elements can be highlighted as guidance for those who need to assess or evaluate indigenous child's best interests when taking a decision that concerns him or her. The first, as an individual, like any other child, an essential element is his or her identity. I already talked about that. But in determining best interests, it's the first step. In other words, along with his or her opinion, the family context, the care and protection required, his or her health and education, consideration of the identity in terms of the culture and ethnic group to which the child belongs and identifies himself, is or herself, is um, a necessary factor. So the guidance is whoever takes a decision regarding a child's best interest needs to take account of his or her identity and respect it. The second element is consideration of the collective cultural rights of the child, which should form part of the determination of best interests. Therefore, the guidance is whoever is to decide, taking as a primary consideration the best interests of an indigenous child, must take into account the cultural rights of the indigenous child and his or her need to exercise them collectively together with the members of his or her group. The third piece of guidance from General Comment 14 is that there should be a conflict um, 
should there be, sorry, should there be a conflict with other rights of the child, like for example, preservation of the family group, or education, for instance, the different elements need to be balanced in order to ensure fulfillment of the ultimate goal of the best interests determination, which is to guarantee that the child enjoys fully all the rights enshrined in the convention and its protocols, and that he or she develops in a harmonious way. And the last element of uh, guidance, when a general measure is adopted, such as a law, um, a bylaw, or a policy aimed at indigenous peoples, due consideration needs to be given not only to issues of general in interest to them, like land property, or access to natural resources, or political participation, but also to the best interests of the indigenous children belonging to that group which should not be left unattended or be violated in favor of the interests of the larger group. Such a balanced community and family-based approach, unfortunately, is rarely followed, even by indigenous groups struggling for their rights. Sadly, in my own country, the political platform advocated by indigenous leaders for this year's Chilean presidential election campaign focuses exclusively on recognition, land recuperation, and security. It is totally silent on children's or women's rights. This may be understandable given decades of state violence against Mapuche people and children who have mobilized to recuperate traditional lands. But it is less understandable if one considers some official statistics, like, for example, the fact that 89% of indigenous children in Chile do not speak or understand any native language and are far behind non-indigenous children on all development indicators. I must say, of course, I have made this point to my colleagues in my own party. <laughs> Women and children need to be given a voice in drawing up and participating in decisions regarding policy priorities and both the state and indigenous leaders are obligated to create that space and take the best interests of the child into account in their political struggle. This brings me quickly to the question of poverty. I know I'm, I'm going to have to cut on some of my remarks. Um, but I do want to touch on poverty and business uh, quickly. Poverty and how it affects children. In fact, Megan has given us most of the figures for, for Australia. Um, and I don't want to repeat them. But just to set the overall global frame, the state of the world children, indigenous, uh, the state of the world indigenous peoples report that I mentioned earlier, quotes that indigenous people represent 5% of the world population, but 15% of the world poor. It is well known that children are overrepresented among those living in poverty. This is also true for indigenous children, who add other vulnerabilities to the poverty level of their families. Um, in Latin America and the Caribbean, a long history of discrimination and exclusion has ensured that indigenous children are in a worse position than poor children in the general population. This is true all over the place. But let me just focus on Latin America. The levels vary according to the countries. No? Um, but in general, the pattern is the same. Um, according to the UN Economic Commission for Latin America and UNICEF, around 63% of all children, all children, 63% in, in, in Latin America are affected by poverty in some way or the other. But the situation is much more critical for indigenous children, 88% of whom are affected. The State of the World uh, report uh, quotes that child mortality in Latin America is 70% higher than in the overall population. And for the case of Australia, although the statistics are rather um, old by now, a native Aboriginal child born today, I think I heard this from Megan, born today can expect to die up to 20 years earlier than his or her non-Indigenous compatriot. 
On a positive note, the new round of censuses in 2010 and 2011, in the case of Latin America, uh, show that at least for three countries where the analysis has been made, Ecuador, Mexico, and Panama, there are improvements in school enrollment and attendance, with deprivation rates falling by one-third in the case of enrollment and one-half in the case of attendance. So pretty important uh, development. But challenges still remain, particularly in regards to the quality of education and the whole question of multicultural bilingual education and access to housing and, uh, and water. As noted by the committee in its recommendations in order to improve the standard of living and reduce poverty among indigenous populations, an overall requirement is for the state to adopt a comprehensive policy and plan of action to positively address the rights of indigenous children, including investment in services and infrastructure in indigenous territories. Other enabling measures to combat poverty as it affects indigenous children are the need to ensure universal free birth registration and appropriately disaggregated statistical systems that will help design specific policies and programs. All these elements that I've mentioned are contained as recommendations in the concluding observations of the Committee to Australia of last year. All of them, including birth registration, which is um, actually quite uh, low, uh, or at least failing no, in, indigenous, uh, in indigenous areas. <coughs> Let me turn to the corporate sector quickly and its impact. Um, the corporate uh, sector impacts upon the rights of indigenous children uh, in, 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 many, in many ways. Um, and in line with a concern that has been um, there quite actively present in the UN fora you know, for the last years, um, a number of, of UN and international entities have come out with guidelines you know, on the question of business and the uh, respect of corporate, that corporations or the business sector in general need to have of human rights in general. But the Committee on the Rights of the Child decided to focus on this issue um, because year after year, report after report of the states being presented to the committee, you know, it came across case after case of violations of children's rights by companies. So we realized in the committee that we needed to provide clear guidance for the states to um, lay out the rule of the land, we could say, no? with regard to how corporations need to organize themselves to be able to respect no? uh, children's rights and be responsible socially and environmentally. So, um, because we realized that it is not enough for companies to subscribe voluntary codes, as we have seen. Voluntary codes are voluntary. No? And those who, even those who subscribe them often don't even follow them. And the best example internationally, of course, is the um, code on the substitutes of breast milk, which is an internationally recognized no? code, but it's voluntary. And even in countries where it has become law of the land, it is not followed by the big corporations. I'm not going to name the, the one that everybody has in mind, of course. <clears throat> um, so this uh, the, 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 the committee came out with general comment uh, number 16 recently. Um, and um, already before, in, in, the one, in the general comment on indigenous children, the committee had clarified that Article 30 called for states to establish positive measures of protection for indigenous children, not only regarding acts or omissions by the states, legislative, judicial, or administrative authorities, but also against acts by other persons. Um, and for the CRC, this includes legal persons, such as business, present in the state party. 
This obligation extends not only to the public, but also to the private sector, implying that the state must regulate and influence the business sector in general to ensure that it does not treat indigenous children in a discriminatory manner. You know, of course, that this is a very delicate and controversial position to take, as it implies that the state must regulate those who don't want to be regulated and to control actions by the business that may impact on, on human rights. Business activities can impact up, upon indigenous uh, children's rights in many different ways. I have chosen to focus on, in, in this talk, on three aspects, land acquisition, participation, and consultation, the role of the media, and economic exploitation, but I'm not gonna cover all three. We'll have a, a written version. It's impossible given the time, and I don't. Want, I want to listen to Sandy. <laughs> um, the, on the question of land acquisition, indigenous communities often live in isolated areas that are coveted for their natural resources, and the impacts of land acquisition on indigenous children can be huge. The environment in which indigenous children live may be polluted or suffer water shortage as a result of business activities. Their social and cultural identity can be disrupted and endangered by the loss of land and natural resources they have previously relied upon. They may move to areas where access to education and health services is not certain or specific for them. Families may be deprived of property rights and children of their inheritance rights. If the displacement is involuntary, then girls can be at a heightened risk of physical and sexual violence as well as economic marginalization. They may be at risk of violence, exploitation and abuse following from environmental degradation, displacement, loss of livelihoods and a breakdown in community ties. Governments have very clear obligations under the convention to prevent the rights of indigenous people from being violated, including as a result of business activity. Preventive measures, for example, can include having a clear legal framework in place regarding the rights of land ownership, possession, and access to lands that indigenous peoples traditionally occupy or use. Governments should also demand that business undertake a full right child rights impact assessment. And this is beginning to happen in Canada, in fact, I don't know in Australia, but in Canada, and I know in New Brunswick in particular, because I've been there, where a new instrument to assess child rights impact by the business sector is being put to, uh, to try. Um, and, and this is to be done in advance or prior to approval, for example, for a land acquisition project. And also children should be provided with access to an effective remedy, including reparation, if their rights are violated because of business activity. States must set a good example so that when they themselves have a business role, state-owned companies of many types, they must not adversely impact um, uh, on children's rights. And let me just give you one quick example. In Norway, the Norges Bank Investment Management annually, it's an investment corporation, no? a bank, annually assesses and publishes the extent to which companies it invests in meet its expectations regarding preventing child labor and promoting child rights in their workplace. So it can be done. In the World Bank, in fact, has been advancing also and has come out now with a um, uh, performance standard um, to apply to investment uh, projects. And the committee has come out in a number of ways with, in different for different countries with recommendations. Um, in particular, with regard to Australia, let me very quickly just say that while acknowledging the existence of a voluntary code of conduct on a sustainable environment by the Australian Mining Council, which is called Enduring Values, the committee in 2012 noted the state's inadequacy in preventing direct and or indirect human rights violations by Australian mining enterprises abroad. 
Um, let me just say that the committee in its uh, general comment number um, 16 um, the, points out uh, to the question of transnational corporations and their operations. Um, in other words, that business that are based in one country, the home country, such as Canada or Australia or the UK, and operate in another country, which is the host country, in resource-rich areas, you know, may be impacting on child rights in those areas. Um, and what the committee calls for is for the, number one, the host country itself to regulate and control the operations of foreign businesses, but often will not do so. And for home states to prevent their businesses, who are, which are domiciled you know, in that home country, um, to, from having a negative impact on the rights of indigenous and other children, even though they may be located beyond their uh, borders. Some of the measures that we recommend are, for example, to withhold public financing or public insurance for those companies operating abroad if they are found to be uh, guilty or complicit of violations of uh, human rights and children's rights. Let me just um, turn to a couple of conclusions. I have attempted to provide you with a broad international perspective of the normative framework on indigenous children and their cultural rights, and I have highlighted some issues that stand out as priorities for action. Maybe the biggest challenge is to ensure that for indigenous boys, girls, and adolescents to enjoy their rights equally with all other children, there is a need to recognize them and to acknowledge the specific cultural context to which they belong or identify themselves, and to extend to them universal policies. It's the same policies no, for all children and programs, universal programs, but which at the same time take account of the need for specificity in their application. This requires, not easy of course, this requires clear political will for dialogue and recognition of indigenous peoples, where respect for children's rights can and should be a fundamental piece. It is not possible to conceive a truly intercultural relationship without the well-being of indigenous children being a common objective for the whole nation. All too often children's rights have been in the shadow of larger community interests, which while being fundamental for recognition and development, should also recognize the identity of children as subject of rights and their realization. Finally, the state and the community need to open and promote spaces of participation for boys, girls, and adolescents. And the call for Megan, by Megan, to open up, you know, to hear the voices of boys, girls, and adolescents in Australia is very, important. Um, in many societies, my own country, I want to quote, being an example, cultural diversity as a value and as a resource for universal public policies is a very recent date. Rather, cultural diversity has been considered a difficulty and homogeneity has been the value. So to explore diversity from the rights of girls, boys, and adolescents, may help us get closer to the richness of our multiculturalness. And this conference, of course, is a sterling example. Thank you very much. <laughs>